Here's a rather short and quickly made video, mostly as a long overdue follow-up to an older video of mine. Back in June of, oh my, 2014, I published a video where I discussed the free romancing saga games on the Super Nintendo. In it, I wasn't able to say that much about Romancing Saga 2, as it was the only Saga game at the time with no English release, not even an unofficial one. But in 2016, we did get one for the Android, and uh, thankfully, because that was such a pain to play, a year later it was also released for basically every single system. I finally played it, so it's time for me to say if all the wait has been worth it. Yes! But it wasn't as great as I hoped. Please let me elaborate. Let's start at the beginning. You control the royal family of Avalon. You start as King Leon, who ends up being killed by one of the fabled seven heroes. His son, Gerard, inherits the throne and through the use of some agent magic obtains all of his father's skills and powers, including the knowledge on how he could avenge him. You play through the game, complete quests, defeat the seven heroes, and every now and then there's a time skip, which gives you the chance to pass the torch to a new main character, as whom you'll form a new party featuring the warriors in your castle, or the allies you made through the completion of quests. You keep getting stronger with each generation, building new additions to your kingdom, getting new characters, collecting better gear for the royal treasury, which will eventually make you strong enough to defeat the seven heroes. Additionally, this modern version added features such as an ore chart to let the players increase the kingdom's earnings even further, a new dungeon called the Maze of Memories with a handful of new additions and a new Game Plus feature, which allows the player to start all over with their items and global skill levels, more on that later, preserved so that they can redo the game in a powered up state and perhaps overcoming former challenges this way. So, at its core, it's a very challenging SNES JRPG that I really wanted to play because I found the idea of the seven heroes very fascinating and their battle theme was incredible. I was pumped to finally play this game, I got it, and while I enjoyed my time, certainly I still felt, uh, well, not let down, but uh, slightly annoyed at a few elements. Whenever a new generation starts, you pick a new ruler who's just a random character that you could potentially recruit anyway. Okay, no character. Best look up some info and find fitting team members to form a good combination for a real solid squad. Then I should get uh, gear from the armory, teach magic to the characters, teach them some basic uh, battle skills, maybe tinker with the battle formations a bit. Yeah, all set. All fine and dandy. Let's go on a quest. And then another one, and maybe a third one, and uh, done. Bam, next generation. Do the whole planning thing all over again. Now, I, I admit, maybe that's just how I played the game, where I spent way too much time with planning things out, but in my defense, the one time that I just picked whomever I felt like, with no thought put into it, things did not go too well. And that's why I started being very strict with how much freedom I was giving myself. I won't deny that it got ridiculous, as in a few generations, I spent more time planning than actually doing quests. Another annoying problem was the global skill levels. 
You see, each character has various skill levels and various weapon and magic types. If the character has talent in something, then their starting level when, they're, when you recruit them will be increased by your global skill level, one that exists for the entire party. This creates a small problem for a lot of the game. You don't have any good archers or bows? You think about ignoring them? Well, you better not! You might later get a super archer with a great bow, so you better keep using bows to keep that skill level high. This made for pretty boring battles, which always followed similar patterns. You always had to use all the weapons, all the magic types, and uh, yeah, I realize, I didn't really need to do this. Towards the end, the monsters give much more experience points, so there's a chance to catch up. But I just didn't want to get stuck in the middle of the game because I neglected something. So I still did it. Really wish there was like a general global level for weapons and magic so that you wouldn't have to use things which are currently useless to you. Uh. Additionally, from a story perspective, I found it a bit dull that the seven heroes were not that omnipresent as I thought they'd be. Yeah, 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 there's a few quests where they're mentioned, but uh, that still felt a tad weak. Romancing Saga had you not only hear about sorrowing every now and then, you also fought his priests, his minions, and of course, you had the fate stones that you tried to collect in order to defeat sorrowing. That did keep me invested in the game and gave me the feeling that I was indeed making progress in the story, which I did not so much get here. I honestly imagined that the seven heroes would be like actual warlords, ruling over specific lands and yet be fighting against them on the battlefield. Something to get used out of the whole idea of being the ruler of a country, but uh, not so much. Romancing Saga 2 is a difficult game, in a franchise of difficult games. At the time of its release, it was very innovative, but as is often the case with experimental games, the execution wasn't ideal. However, with that said, I wish to make it clear that I still had quite a bit of fun with the game. Planning out how to expand my kingdom was quite interesting. I had to decide how to spend the funds properly what was worth investing into, what could wait, and in all fairness, once these seven heroes did become my prime targets, the story did get much more engaging, and once I took control over the final emperor, things did get really fun. Now true, this is the last team you get, you can't recover LP normally in this game, so it was quite a pain in that regard, trying to keep everyone alive so they reach the final boss. But it did also make me stick with this party for far longer than the rest, and as such, I did form a far stronger connection with it than with the others throughout the game. The ending is simple but sweet, so I'm leaving the game with a positive attitude. If you're an experienced Saga fan, then consider giving it a go. And now for some general Saga news. Following the December 2016 release of Saga Scarlet Grace on the PS Vita, the game appeared on several additional systems in August 2018. However, there's still no English release, although Akitoshi Kawazu promises that one is coming. And of course, an English release of Romancing Saga 3 is also promised, but once again, we'll have to wait and see. Well, that'd be it for today, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time.